Um, yeah, so I want to I want to talk about USRC. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for the for the opportunity to do this first. Um, and I also want to say that there's a, a long list of, of co-authors here. These are uh, the uh, the people that are on the current steering committee and the people that are the uh, the co-founders and and have been on the steering committee before. Um, and so I'm really representing the uh, the 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 steering committee in some sense and the community as a whole rather than representing myself. And so the I think what I'm gonna to try to talk about is what the community has done and, and where some of the challenges remain. Okay, um, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk about three things, the state of the organization overall, uh, a new grant that we have from the Sloan Foundation and what we think that will enable us to do and the first conference that'll be coming up in about a month and a half. All right, so one one person's coming, hopefully. Um, so just to start off with the, we started off with a mission that had three roles initially, or three three pieces initially. Um, community, creating a, a community that shares knowledge, connections, and resources. Um, advocacy in terms of promoting RSEs, their impact, and their role. And, and resources, which is to help RSEs by providing information and, and tools and examples that that support uh, RSEs as individuals and as groups. And we realized fairly quickly that we needed to add uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, DEI, the kind of the US version of VDIA here, um, as, as a fourth step, a fourth part of our mission. So we've we've done that. And, um, and this is actually, I would say, a, a fairly active piece of what we're trying to do again as a community. Uh, our membership has been growing nicely over the roughly uh, five years that we've been around. We're up to just under 2,000 people now as of uh, a few days ago. Um, and and that's kind of good in some sense. It's uh, roughly half of the size of the society's community uh, in a country that's six times as big um, in terms of population. And so we certainly have a long way to grow, um, but, uh, but I think we're, we're off on a good start at this point. Um, our members, as you might uh, guess, are, are mostly in the US, but not entirely. Um, we do have people that are, are members from around the world. Um, and in particular, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that we also seem to have a, a fair number of Canadian members. Um, and perhaps that's just because there is no uh, formal Canadian group at this point. Hmm. Okay. Um, we have a bunch of different uh, working groups and, and we're organized in a way that um, lets people create groups when they want and join groups when they want. And, uh, and, and groups in general always have at least two co-leaders. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and really are intended to be a way that the community can express its needs and can become active in actually then addressing those needs. So there's a, an awards committee that's currently being formed that I'll talk about a little bit later, a, a code of conduct and moderation committee, which is actually quite interesting because it's gone through some changes and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, a DEI group, uh, education and training, a grants group that's being formed. Um, we have a group on group management and that's because we've gotten to the point now where we realize that different groups were doing things in different ways and some of those ways were better than others. And so we're trying to basically uh, help groups learn from other groups and, and do things as effectively as they can. Uh, we have a, a mentorship program, an outreach group, a uh, national lab group. Um, so at least in the US, we've got, I would guess about 20% of our members are in national labs uh, and probably 70% are in universities and the other 10% are in industry. And so that national lab piece is actually kind of a, a fairly big significant piece and it has different challenges and so the, the folks that are in national labs are really trying to uh, trying to figure out how to address their own challenges in the context of, of RSE challenges overall. Um, we also have a group leaders network, a neuroscience group that's kind of starting hopefully. And so the idea is that we're trying to figure out kind of what are affinity groups that make sense as well. What, what types of sub elements of the community um, want to organize themselves into new areas. Uh, and we also have a couple of regional groups. We have uh, four at this point in uh, Chicago, the uh, kind of Denver, Colorado area, uh, New England and, and New Orleans. And this is something that's really open for anybody. And it's not yet clear to us how useful this is gonna be and if this is gonna make sense, but we're, we're trying it to see what happens. 
Um, if we try to look at the community as a whole, it's some of these groups that I've talked about previously are, are really elements of the community. And and I think, and, and we think uh, as the, the steering committee, that we don't completely understand the community at this point, and we don't really understand necessarily what groups are going to form. So we're, again, we're trying to make things open so that groups can form and can progress as they want. Um, disciplines is an area that we haven't really explored very well yet. The, the neuroscience group was the first one that's kind of come forward and they said, right, we want to, we want to have a group and talk about neuroscience issues. Um, there is a, a physics and astronomy uh, channel on Slack and there's been some discussion in there. And so, so we're, we're hopeful that more of these groups will form over time. Um, there's also uh, event channels that may lead to more of these. Uh, we don't know, there's a, an AGU, uh, American Geophysical Union uh, channel, for example. And so it seems like there's probably a geoscience group, but it hasn't quite formed into a, a technical group yet. Um, we also have, again, as I was saying, these kind of things about different job types, about people in national labs, about people in industry, about students. Uh, we have personal characteristics groups. So we have an LGBTQ uh, group that is reasonably active at this point. Uh, in terms of geography, again, uh, we, we have a, a big country, which makes it actually hard to do things nationally in, in a lot of ways. And so regional groups we think make sense. Um, again, there's four formal groups and then six more geographic channels that exist. And then we also have people that are interested specifically on different technical aspects. And they may think of that as kind of their, their core activity that they're interested in cloud computing or, or data engineering or containers or something else. So, so I think the maybe the message that I want to leave from this slide is that the community is a really complex thing and we're trying to create different uh, means of, of people being able to find the elements of the community that make sense to them and to um, and to progress in those areas. Um, our code of conduct is, again, as I was saying, has kind of been an interesting journey as well. Um, it was, we drafted one initially in 2019, kind of right when we were starting, and that was updated to include a diversity statement in 2021. Um, and in 2022, we created a, a transparency log because we realized that there were some things that were happening and it wasn't clear to everybody what was actually happening. Um, and so uh, code of conduct is an area that I don't, I have to say, I don't understand well enough by any means, um, but it does seem like there are some best practices and some community uh, awareness. And it's, um, it, it's interesting to see kind of how this is going forward. Uh, so the code of conduct transparency log then kind of has to be transparent enough to let people be confident that the code of conduct community and the code of conduct itself are working but they actually can't be so transparent that they give away details of, of what's happened. And so it's, again, this kind of interesting uh, discussion. Um, a, a new working group formed last year um, to help with code of conduct moderation. There were people that were really interested in doing this and thought that they could do a better job than, than how we were doing it. And so we started a group to, to let this happen. Um, and we're currently transitioning to a new code of conduct um, and a, a new code of conduct process in October. And so there's going to be a new committee. Um, there's an open nomination process for that. The people are being uh, brought onto that now. And we're using uh, Otter Tech as a, a company to do formal training in this to, uh, again, to try to improve the, the process. Um, I think this is the, I would say this is the first community that I've been involved with that's of this size where these processes are important. And it's really interesting to see kind of how as a community grows, you get things that you could do just by talking to each other at a small scale that stop, that basically stop working that way when you go to a large scale and you have to go to, to more formal processes. Um, so if we try to look at the community as a whole, we have, um, we have information we know, we have a lot of information we don't know. Um, the, the Slack channel is the best information that we, that we think we have. Um, and we have some geographic and institution data but the data may not be current. Um, as is the case for a lot of organizations, we're very good at getting information about people when they join. Um, we're not very good at updating that over time. Um, we also have the data that was in the international RSC survey from the, from the US side, but that was actually only 160 responses. And again, we're at about 2000 people. So, so we're not completely representing the community. Is it representative? We don't really know. Um, so we have the, the issue that that the data in the survey may or may not represent the RSA community as a whole, and, and it may or may not represent US RSC specifically members either. So, um, so we do have, again, some information. 
Um, and the DEI and outreach working groups are really interested in doing a survey. And so hopefully that will happen in the near future. But again, surveys end up being um, more complicated than you think they're going to when you're in large formal organizations. And so we need to go through an IRB process and and some other things that are uh, that are making this uh, slower than it could be. Um, the working groups, one of the things that's nice about them is that they create their own events and we generally try to do things through uh, through Zoom a lot of the time and we try to record them. Um, some of these events are made uh, available on a YouTube channel that are public and listed. Some of them are on the YouTube channel but are not listed and we just share the links on Slack. Um, and so we've had, uh, we have a, a speaker series in DEI that's pretty active. We have a DEI media club that's done both books and podcasts and movies and then talked about them. Uh, we have an education and training uh, seminar series for people that are interested in education and training about software engineering, about research software engineering, about RSEs. And we have a funder speaker series and um, and maybe partly because I've been leading the organization of that, I think it's quite interesting. Um, we've had, I think at this point, six funders come in and talk to us about kind of what they think about research software engineering, what programs they're offering and what kind of information they'd like to hear from us that will help them figure out how to create better programs. And so we're, uh, I think USRSC, again, one of the interesting things is we're, we're focused on RSEs, but we also try to reach out in a bunch of other areas to either bring in other communities or to learn from other communities or to influence other communities. We have a series of community calls that are generally monthly and not entirely. Uh, there's just a, a list of what some of the ones here have been. Uh, the most recent one was about career mentoring plans. Uh, again, these are uh, organized by a community call working group. Um, there's a, a, ser a call for topics and people vote on which topic they would like to see in each month and then somebody goes ahead and organizes it. It's usually, I don't know, 20 minutes of talking and then kind of 40 minutes of breakout discussion. And then we record the, uh, sorry, not record, we take notes and then try to bring that information back to the group as a whole. Uh, we had a community building workshop last year that was um, in Princeton, where this was really the first event that we had done post-COVID, which was uh, about 45 people coming together, um, talking about how to actually build up the USRC community. What did we need to do? We'd actually um, put in a proposal to get funding for this workshop in 2019. And then when COVID happened, it didn't happen for quite a while. And so Initially, it was going to be how do we turn a 50 member organization into a larger organization? And then it turned out to be how do we turn a 1500 member organization into a larger organization? But it, um, I, I think a lot of the things that we did were, were fairly similar. You can see the, the breakout group topics there. Um, a lot of these have turned into working groups or have turned into some other part of the organization at this point. Um, we have had a couple of other events as well. We did a, a virtual workshop last fall that was kind of in preparation for our first conference. We wanted to try some of these things, but not to bring people together physically and, and see how things worked. Um, so we had a two half days with a keynote, a bunch of talks, a bunch of breakout sessions. Uh, we also last year brought people together along with ADSA, the Academic Data Science Alliance, uh, to talk about career support for RSEs and data scientists. And this has led to a, uh, a guidebook that just came out within the last month or so, um, which is called Hiring, Managing, and Retaining Data Scientists and Research Software Engineers in Academia. And this is really intended to be um, something that uh, middle management and, and higher management at universities and uh, mostly at national, uh, mostly at universities, but also at national labs to some extent um, can look at. Uh, RSE group leaders can look at this and, and can see Kind of what what if people learn from uh, what what if people learn what what can they do differently in their hiring? Um, we also do a bunch of different things at other conferences as well. So uh, so PERC is a conference on cyber infrastructure in the U.S. that happens annually. We've had um, workshops there. Uh, we've had workshops at the eScience conference last year and this year, uh, and we've had workshops at the SC conference, and we'll have a panel at the SC conference as well coming up this year. Um, so, so a lot of what we do is not just directed at ourselves, but directed at people that we think might be RSEs that are in other events um, where we want to try to give them a, a place to come together and, uh, and talk to each other as well as 
Uh, in some of these cases, like in supercomputing, we're really interested in getting HPC center managers to come in and, and learn about RSCs or, um, or, or others like that. Uh, we had a booth at the supercomputing conference last year, or a, a stand, I guess, if you want to say that. Um, this was the first time that we had done this, and it was uh, it was really good because uh, supercomputing the conference has, I don't know, 13,000 people that come, and it was kind of nice to have them all be able to, to see a little bit about RSEs and research software engineering, um, to kind of learn what we're doing, to in some cases decide maybe they are RSEs. Um, and in some cases, maybe they can say to somebody else, oh, you know, I, I learned about RSEs. You should, this might be what you're doing. You should, uh, you should look into this. Uh, we have a job board, which is fairly active. We've had about 370 jobs listed in the last uh, two years, roughly. Uh, there are about 20 um, RSE jobs that are listed currently and uh, about five related jobs. Um, so we always, we go through these discussions about is this an RSE job or is it not? And it's, uh, we, we don't want to not list jobs that aren't, but we don't want to focus on them either. Um, there's a Google form to submit, and so this then gets done quickly by, again, a volunteer group called the, the Job Post Team. Um, the jobs get um, posted in our jobs channel in Slack, in Twitter, and in Mastodon. And um, we've had a couple of people that have, have said that they've gotten jobs through this, and it's kind of exciting to hear that. We, in the last year, have changed to a new financial uh, or fiscal sponsor, Community Initiatives. Um, so USRSC is not a uh, society, it's not an independent organization like the society here. Um, it is a um, an association and it's an association under a fiscal sponsor and the fiscal sponsor then gives us that kind of charity status. Um, and so Community Initiatives is that sponsor now. Um, the reason we went to community initiatives from our from our previous sponsor was to be able to accept grants, uh, to be able to support legal services, to be able to support crowdfunding and donation management, um, and some insurance for volunteers. But one thing is it also made it possible for us to hire staff, which we've never done. So we can now hire people under community initiatives as opposed to having to hire somebody in a university and then have them kind of work on USRSE things. Um, it also enables us to reimburse members for expenses that they have on our behalf. Uh, we think that at some point we probably will become our own um, nonprofit or, or charity in, in uh, British terms, um, but we think right now there's not a strong enough reason to do it and, and there's too much cost to doing it. Um, so just to kind of wrap up this piece, um, when the steering committee that I was on last year was wrapping things up, uh, we were talking about what our priorities were going to be for this year. And the priorities were going to be to hold a conference, to better support working groups and to encourage people to join those working groups, to find funding to support our mission and growth um, in, in people and in activities and events and resources and in organizational tools and to improve the governance, uh, specifically the code of conduct, and to think about an external advisory board. So having said that, uh, one of the ways that we went through this was trying to actually get a grant. And we looked at this by saying that we'd done a bunch of stuff over five years and it was all quite good. And we'd had uh, lots of calls. We had a 200 times increase in members. Uh, we feel like we have fostered community. We've gotten a lot of collaboration going and and we really increased recognition and awareness of RSEs in the US, although uh, still not to the extent that it's happened in the UK, um, but that our future growth was gonna be limited by the fact that everything that we were doing is volunteer based, right? We don't have the SSI that was um, helping us in any way, right? So everything was volunteer based with no, no funding. Um, and so we started uh, a proposal to address this that ended up being finished by the 2023 steering committee um, and Ian Cosden, who is the uh, US RSE uh, Steering Committee Chair, was the PI of this proposal. And the proposal was for $800,000 over two years to the Sloan Foundation. Um, it was awarded and started May 1st of this year. And again, it's through uh, community initiatives as the, the fiscal sponsor. And it basically is asking for three different things that we would do uh, to support dedicated staff, to support activities and initiatives, and to support organizational tools and community health. And so dedicated staff, just to start with, uh, as, as I was saying, we've really been successful because of dedicated volunteers. And we don't want to see that change, 
But we also think that we've kind of reached a limit in some sense of what we can do with peer volunteers. And so we think that dedicated staff positions would enable us to support and grow some of the community activities, for example, having a community manager to help some of these things happen, um, to, uh, to prioritize uh, communications and just basically and just make these things happen um, where volunteers don't necessarily have time to do everything. And then to focus on long-term financial sustainability, uh, to think about what happens after this two-year grant and to figure out how do we actually do better fundraising and sponsorship and, and membership and, and grants overall. So we're hiring two staff members, um, a community manager, which is a, a full-time 100% uh, time uh, position uh, that would support the, the community, uh, help with communications, newsletters, announcements, things like that, events, logistics, and, and planning, and outreach and community management. Um, and we're also uh, hiring a part-time executive director that's between 30 and 50% with the idea that, that this person's first job is financial, st so, um, financial sustainability of USRSE overall and trying to grow this so that this can become a full-time job that can support itself and support the rest of USRSE. Uh, job ads are out now. Uh, actually, there's interviews going on now, um, but if anybody is interested, uh, the interviews are not done yet, and so if you have a really strong case to make, um, please please inter please uh, submit a, a resume. Um, the second thing then is activities and initiatives, um, and I'll just go through these. Uh, the first thing, that, the first of these is the conference. Um, so we will have a conference in October this year. We will plan to have a conference next year as well. Um, we needed funding to actually help do this. Um, so just to reserve a venue, for example, we needed to put down a, a deposit on the venue. We didn't have the funding. Right, so the Sloan funds help us actually do that. Um, to do booking and logistics, uh, we're gonna be providing lunches and coffee breaks and a reception and dinner. Um, and so some of those can be supported by, um, by registration fees and by sponsorship, but, uh, but having the Sloan Foundation money actually helps us kind of not have to rely on those completely this first year. Um, and yeah. So, and then second part of this is community initiative and travel grants. So we're trying to, uh, we're trying to basically support activities that people in the community want to do, but they need money to do. Uh, $100 to $10,000 per proposal. We expect most of them are gonna be about 2,500 in that range. Uh, we have quarterly application decision rounds. And so um, people basically can say, I'd like this much money to do this thing. And, and there's a committee that will look at it and say, yes, we'll give you that money goes through the fiscal sponsor, goes to you, goes to your university, goes to whatever the right thing is. Um, we imagine things like uh, group activities, uh, training events, um, going places to talk about RSE work or technical infrastructure that actually makes a working group work that, that just didn't work on purely, uh, purely free infrastructure. Um, these are reviewed then based on uh, how they're gonna impact the community. Are they aligned to the US RSE mission? Um, is there other funding available that could support them, or is this the only way it's going to happen? And um, are the people that are submitting um, qualified to do this? Do they Have they demonstrated an impact in USRC and an interest in the past? And we have a grants committee then that will make these decisions, and this is a new working group that's uh, basically formed. Um, and we'll have rotating people each year. Uh, we also then have awards. Um, which, well, sorry, we will have awards. Uh, so the idea is that we want to create RSE awards, uh, recognizing outstanding achievement in different categories. Uh, we're thinking of impact, rising star, and education and training as the three initial categories. Um, but this is still being discussed, and this new awards committee will, will decide what these categories are. Um, and it'll oversee the, the awards program overall. Um, we don't know exactly what these prizes are going to be yet. Again, that's part of what the awards committee will determine. Uh, as well as how nominations are solicited and uh, how people are, are selected. Um, but we are kind of excited by this because we haven't actually done anything like this. I was, um, I think last year, if I remember right, when the RSE Catalyst idea came out here, um, it was kind of, it was really nice. It recognized a lot of people uh, and, and I think it was really helpful. And it's something that in the US we haven't done yet. And so we, we wanna do something kind of like that, although, uh, probably will give prizes that have a little bit of money attached and not just little pins. Okay, the last piece uh, then of the Sloan Award is, um, is organizational tools and community health. 
Um, one of these pieces, as I was talking about, is the DEI piece that we are actually um, paying an organization to do some consulting for us to look at our code of conduct and, and other policies from a DEI perspective and to give us advice about what we should be changing. Uh, to do the, the code of conduct response training again, as I mentioned, um, swag, so um, t-shirts, uh, coffee mugs, a few other things we'll give out, uh, and then tools. And, and so one of the things that's happened for us, and I don't know if this has happened here or not, is that we actually have decided we need to go to member management software and we don't we don't really want to write this ourselves so we would like to just pay somebody that that already does this um, and also election software um, it's been relatively complicated for us to do elections and to figure out who can vote um, and then to give them ballots and then to actually do the process and so again that's just kind of minor stuff that we want to uh, we want to simplify our, our lives by having a little bit of money to pay for it we hope that this grant then is not going to lead to big changes for USRC, but is going to make us able to do some new things without hurting any of the existing things. I think that's that's really going to be a, a question to see how this works. Um, the steering committee is going to continue as elected volunteer community members. This grant does not support anybody on the steering committee. It doesn't support the PI. Um, so it is intended to do new things entirely and not to pay off any of the volunteers that have been working. Um, and we hope that that's going to lead to a lack of tension between people that are doing volunteer activity and people that are being paid for activity because we're going to try to, to limit the paid part to very specific things. Um, the executive director and the community manager will report to the chair of the steering committee. Those will, again, kind of be part of the same organization and, and the governance will stay the same. Okay, and so then the last thing to talk about then is the, is the conference coming up in October. Uh, this, as, as we were saying, will be the first time that we're doing this. Um, it was interesting. We, we looked back and we had a video of our 2020 annual general meeting and this was just a, a screen capture of that video. Uh, which was saying that we wanted to uh, have a conference, maybe in 2023. Um, we have a hashtag that's actually not the right hashtag, but hard to predict hashtags three years in advance. Um, and and that we wanted to, yeah, we, we wanted to do this. And, and we thought this was the time that we could do it. And it turned out that this actually is the time we can do it. So the vision for doing this led to, again, partial support of the conference from Sloan. Uh, Sandra Giesing was chose, uh, chosen as the lead organizer based on her experience doing a, a number of these activities. Um, she has an affiliation with the University of Illinois Chicago. And with that and the Sloan bootstrapping funds, that was enough to get us a location and be able to book space. Uh, we had a call for volunteers for all the other positions. For every committee, we have at least two co-chairs. There's generally one person that was really excited by this, but didn't have a lot of experience in the area. And then one person that had a lot of experience in the area as well. And so we're trying to do things in a way that we're training people through this process. And I'm assuming that's the same thing that happens here based on the, on the number of volunteers that I see uh, every year here. Um, every committee also then has a lot of volunteers that are part of that committee. Uh, there's a bunch of organizations that are sponsoring this, and we have travel and dependent care grants that are available. Uh, travel grants are aimed at students and early career participants. Uh, dependent care uh, gives people uh, funding to, uh, to support dependents that maybe need to come with them to the event. Um, so the, the conference is going to be uh, October 16th through 18th. Uh, Neil Chu Hong is one of our keynote speakers. Uh, Marianne Leung is the other. Uh, we're going to have a, a funders panel, which will be interesting to bring in four or five funders and have them talk about uh, what kind of interaction they want to have with research software engineers. Uh, we have uh, in about 95 submissions, including uh, birds of a feather kind of discussions. Uh, we had a notebook uh, submission so people could submit notebooks that they thought were interesting demonstrations of software. Uh, we had uh, full and short papers, posters, talks, tutorials, and workshops. There's also a student program. There are sponsor lightning talks. And so it's going to be a pretty busy, uh, roughly two, I think it's two and three quarter days. Um, and so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Is anybody, anybody else planning on coming? One, two, all right, three. All right, very good. So a few people. Um, I, I have to say, it's interesting. I think when I came to this the first time in 2016 in Manchester, um, we had a bunch of U.S. people, and the U.S. participation here has kind of died off a little bit, it seems like. 
Uh, and so it's maybe it's because as different organizations form, then different people kind of find it easier to travel to their own to their own place and, and not here. But uh, but if anybody's interested, please please come. I think it'll be a good event. Um, we are not doing anything online this time. Um, so I think it's great that that this conference is. Um, but we're kind of at the the, uh, the beginning stage, and hopefully next year in 2024 we'll be able to to offer some online part as well once we figure out some of the the local part first. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up where we are, um, I, we've had really six successful years at this point, and we're we're excited that there is more coming that we're continuing to grow. Um, we in 2018 there were about 10 of us that started saying. What would an organization look like? How could we do this? How how can we create a website? How can we start getting people interested? Um, in 2019 to today, we've had about 200 uh, times growth in the community. Uh, almost everything that we did initially has been redone at least once. Um, so right, so we did an initial website that wasn't really very good in the end. Uh, today, it was very good at the beginning. Um, most of the committees have changed. Again, code of conduct has changed. So. So everything has been a learning experience where we've tried things, it's worked for a while, then we figured out how to do it better, and we've tried to improve it. Uh, we think going forward, having two professional staff in addition to volunteers is really gonna make a big difference. Uh, we think it'll add stability and allow for more continuous efforts. Uh, we hope that it will add more community growth and, and it will lead to sustainability challenges, right? because if you hire people, then you have to keep supporting them. Um, and so that is gonna be something that we have to, to work hard on. Uh, annual conferences, we think will be uh, a big deal. Um, and then we're also, as I was saying, trying to have impact on institutions and other parts of the larger research ecosystem. Um, it was interesting in the leaders meeting that we had uh, yesterday for some of us, uh, Simon gave a, a introduction talk and in the introduction, he said something like, um, what should we be doing within the RSE organization. And the answer can't be, we're gonna ask the SSI to do this for us. And so I think that's really our, our challenge in the US is we don't, we don't have an SSI, right? So we have to do everything ourselves. And, and that I think makes things harder in some ways, but also I think leverages volunteers in a, in a beneficial way as well. And so we are really trying to think about, all right, how does the RSE community impact institutions? How does it impact funders? How does it impact publishers? Um, and in some of those, we've been beginning to be successful and in other ones, we still have, I think, a long way to go. Um, we are focused on US impact um, specifically, but we welcome members for, from other places. And we realize that a lot of the topics that we're looking at really are global topics. Um, so, so we think that there are almost always going to be global answers, although they may need to be customized for particular contexts. So just to you know, finally um, wrap up, I want to say that um, we've been successful because of the people, right? Because of the working group chairs, because of the members who have done amazing things. Um, again, purely volunteer based. Uh, the community calls have been successful in bringing people together. The Slack membership has been good. Um, and overall, it's just, it's interesting to see a bunch of the, the comments that we get. And, and I think, uh, as, as Gail was saying in the, the first keynote, um, Right. We've created a community really as the main thing we've done. Uh, and the community has become self-reinforcing in some sense. You see people that are happy with the community, they bring in more people. And the, the aspect of having people that are happy to work together, I think is probably again, the, the most important thing. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Dan, for that really, it's really exciting to hear how much progress you've made in so much so little time. Uh, so we have plenty of time for some questions. So the first question on Slido is, uh, all of your groups and committees at USRSC are really impressive. How do you get so many people to volunteer their time? Yeah, um, I, and actually, I guess I, I should say, I didn't say this during the talk, but I probably should have, that I think almost everything that we've done or an awful lot of what we've done has been um, in being inspired by what's happened here and trying to follow the best practices of it. So so I think if if the RSA community here hadn't existed, there's there isn't any way that we could have done this. So it's um, it's it's definitely part of a, a global movement. Um, so then to answer this question specifically, I think the answer is, 
in some senses, frustration. Um, so with a lot of things, and I think with the RSC community as well, people come together because they have a problem that they want to solve. And in most cases, it's because they are unhappy with something. They're unhappy with how they're recognized for their work. They're, um, well, actually, that's the main one is actually they're, they're unhappy <laughs> with how they're recognized for their work. Um, but but they want to do something about it. They want to have a, a better career. They don't want to go to industry. They don't want to. Um, they don't want to figure out how to sell things to people through new ads. They right. They they want to make a contribution to to scholarship in some way to to academia, or to national labs or or something else. Um, and so, I think the the question I guess really is is kind of how do you move from frustration to action. And it seems like that is often by creating a vision and talking about that vision and having it be a vision that people can buy into, um, not just that they see it as somebody else's vision, but it becomes part of their own vision. And so I think we've been um, reasonably successful at doing that and doing it by, by starting off with an organization that didn't really have much organization and letting the organization develop as people wanted it to, wanted it to be. Um, so I think, so that's probably the main thing is we've just tried to create opportunities and, and there's a slide that I didn't actually use that Ian Cosden gives if he gives a talk about this, which is, um, it, it has like six or seven questions that say, can I do something? And the answer is always yes. Um, no matter what the question is, can I create a Slack channel? Yes. Can I, can I create a new working group? Yes. Can I create a new regional group? Yes. Can I talk about this in Slack? Yes. So it's, so I think it's really just being open to to letting people do whatever they want, um, subject to the code of conduct. <laughs> Thank you. So next question, from your perspective, is RSE an established, uh, sorry, a, a recognizable profession in US academia? Um, it depends a lot on where you are. So I would say there are there are groups at a number of universities. Um, at those universities, people that work with those groups would say that RSE is a recognizable profession. Um, people in other universities generally have no idea what RSE is. And people in those universities that don't work with research software probably have no idea what RSE is. So I think we're, I think I would say we're behind where things are here. Um, but we're moving in the right direction and the number of universities with groups is growing. And we get these nice um, discussions, which may maybe have happened here in the past. Um, so there's a, a relatively large university that within the last three months has been saying, we, we recognize that we have a need for RSCs. We don't actually have this title at our university. We don't have any that we know of, although maybe there are some. How could we get started? Or, Right. Should should we try to have a workshop? Should we try to hire somebody? What should we do? So there's, I, I think the recognition is growing, and it's growing in places that don't have RSEs, but it still is relatively weak. Um, it's it's actually better in national labs, where this kind of position has existed for a long time, but in different national labs it had different titles, um, and uh, and it's often been treated as a second class um, job in national labs that isn't kind of the science job, it's the support job. Mm -hmm. And so kind of trying to, to push that up has been another issue that, again, I think has been somewhat successful, but still has a long way to go. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of that is familiar, for, I think, from the journey here as well. So next question, I think, uh, follows on from the first one in some sense. It's really great to hear that USRSE already has so many, so much people power, so much productivity in its working groups. Uh, do you think there's space for cross-pollination and cross-coordination between Society of RSE here, USRSC, and maybe others to reduce duplicated effort and try and increase everyone's capacity? Yeah, so I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, I think the question that I don't know the answer to is is actually how to do this. And, and so it, I, it would be interesting actually to see like how many of the people, the, the 2000 people that are on the US RSE Slack are also on the society Slack and, and vice versa. And I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I know there are, there certainly are some, we see some discussions that happen in both places or some people like post a call in both places, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll say honestly, one of the challenges I think is what the role of the society is globally. 
um, because the, I think the society has kind of a, a bifurcated view of, of itself in some sense, where it's sometimes it's the UK society and sometimes it's the global society. Um, and that I think leads to challenges when when something appears to be done as a global piece, but it's really being done very strongly in the UK context. Um, it kind of makes people, at least in the US, then think, is this really what we want to, do we want to do something in this context or do we need to create our own version of this that focuses on the US context? And so I, I don't know how we actually bring those two things together completely. One, I will say one of the things that we've, I think that, that some of us have tried to do is to, uh, is to work at a level above these uh, the RSE organizations. So um, thinking about activities that are research software activities more generally uh, within the, so uh, the Research Software Alliance and RDA as examples of, of organizations that are trying to reach out globally um, uh, across areas. So just as an example of this, uh, again, I talked about the fact that we have funder talks in US RSE and we've had uh, so far six of them. I think we have two more scheduled. So there's eight different funding organizations we've had come in and talk. Um, RISA has a funders forum where we get um, all of the research funders, uh, research software funders we can together for them to talk to each other. Um, those eight in the US have been involved in that, plus uh, probably four or five from the UK, plus people from Germany and, and a bunch of other places. So. So I, th I think the question is like, what's the right level to talk about some of these issues? Is there, is, is there an issue that's purely based on how research software is funded? Um, if so, that's probably a global question and it doesn't make sense to talk about it in any national context. Um, but is there something about how research software is funded in the US and how does that work with the, uh, the recent Nelson memo that calls for open data, right? So that's a very specific US piece and it's probably better to talk about that in the US context. So. So I, I, I would say, I think we're, USRC is very willing to um, be involved in things globally and to be a, kind of a, a global participant, but it's, it's hard to figure out, again, how to, how to do that in an effective way. Um, and so I, I, I don't know, we, if, I mean, I guess one thing we could do is if there's people, the, if the uh, current trustee is here or the uh, the, the new trustees would like to to talk with the current steering committee of USRC. We could maybe schedule a kind of some discussion session and talk about right now. How do we do things better together? Thank you very much. And that is all the time we have for questions, which perfectly leads us to suggest that maybe you can have that conversation over coffee. So yeah, let's thank Dan again.